Hello, Drs. LeBlanc, DeFries, and Ribeiro. Before we begin, I want to say a huge thank you. Hello, Drs. LeBlanc, DeFries, and Ribeiro. Before we begin, I want to say a huge thank you for not only joining us as our Transition Cow Trifecta speakers, but for also taking the time out of your busy schedules to chat with me today and discuss some of the questions that weren't answered last week. So to start off, can each of you please give me a recap of your presentations from our webinar? I don't know if you'd like to start first, Dr. Ribeiro. Yeah, sure. Um, so my presentation was focused on the uh, kind of the long-term effects of uh, clinical diseases during the first three weeks postpartum and uh, just uh, emphasize the impact it has on uh, milk production, on uh, reproduction, and also on cooling. And uh, I think I end up with uh, some recent analysis that we have done uh, related to the economics of this and how costly uh, diseases in the early postpartum period are. Um, and just uh, emphasizing how the opportunities uh, there are uh, they're available for producers to make improvements in the transition management and uh, uh, improve uh, um, dairy production system in general and, and, and have some economical returns as well. Thanks very much. And just going in the direction of my, uh, my screen or the order of my screen, Dr. LeBlanc, would you like to go next? Sure. Thanks, Abby. Um, so I was uh, trying to underline some of the research uh, that our group is doing towards uh, setting the stage through transition cow health for um, reproductive success later on. Um, there's opportunities, I think, well, certainly for research for us to understand things better, but, but also for application in the field to uh, for producers and their veterinarians, nutritionists, advisors to um, know and, and look into what the prevalence of uh, hypocalcemia and ketosis are and of uterine disease as well. Um, we, we have ways to do all those things and, and we have a number of tools in our toolkit to um, not only see how much these might be playing a role in a given herd, um, but actually to be a little bit more proactive about prevention. Um, and finally, we've got some uh, new bits and pieces around treatment of ketosis, for example, with the, the, the possible angle of um, reduced milking frequency in terms of prevention of hypocalcemia um, with uh, a little bit of new information about how and where um, negative BCAD feed supplements might fit for, for dry cows um, and, and some work that's uh, just finishing up and, and starting to yield results about how um, the combination of all these health uh, issues in the transition period uh, can lead to cows being more or less likely to actually express estrus um, and, and be fertile at their first service. Thanks very much. And last but certainly not least, Dr. DeFries. Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, again, this opportunity. So yeah, in my presentation, um, I guess I, I focused in on Specifically how, obviously, and, and as the other two speakers have already mentioned, we have challenges uh, in, in early lactation with health and, and later effects on reproduction and, and long-term production. Uh, and we know that a lot of those challenges go back into the dry period and even prior to that. And uh, from a nutritional management standpoint, uh, we have opportunities to uh, mitigate the risk of some of those uh, negative things from happening. And, and so I covered some of the research that we've been doing in that area, specifically looking at some of the risk factors related to uh, body condition and, and interactions with intake and, and dietary management during the dry period. And so summarize some of the work that we've done looking at dry cow diets and how those are uh, designed and, and managed to ensure that we have good consistent intake without that body condition gain or loss during the dry period and how that then translates into uh, improvements in, in transition into lactation. Uh, that's more in general, but then I also touched on some of the more recent work that we've been doing, looking at opportunities for more precision nutritional management in and around that time period as well, uh, focusing in on not only 
the individual nutritional requirements of cows, but also the behavioral requirements and how those two might interact in terms of, uh, say, meeting those, those needs. And then finally, also, as it relates to this uh, and, and specifically related to the behavior of cows, is thinking about how we can also use behavior from a prediction standpoint in terms of uh, identifying, say, risk of disease and um, using that as an opportunity to, to improve management of those animals in and around that time period as well. Great, thank you. So we've got quite a few questions, so I'm going to dive in here now. Uh, I'll begin with a couple of questions that, um, that are more general, and then I'm going to start to focus on specific topics and research. So my first question for all of you is, what are your thoughts on defining the transition period as three weeks prior to and three weeks beyond calving? I'll have a go. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense from a management standpoint, but really, um, and this is not an original thought by any means, but I would say that, you know, the, the next lactation really begins the day the last one ends. So, so I think we probably need to think maybe a little more broadly and holistically um, for the entire dry period as being pretty important for managing cows nutritionally, socially, and, and otherwise to set them up for, um, for health production, fertility, our, our whole trifecta. Um, so we probably need to open the window a little more widely on the, on the front end to include the, the whole of, of the dry period. Um, Postpartum, uh, you know, again, we could think about uh, really everything that happens leading up to that first service is is probably important. So again, we could we could broaden it there, but um, uh, really those first weeks after calving um, are probably the, the most critical ones. Yeah, I would I would echo that, and and that kind of came to my mind in that too. Like those those definitions we have are generally aligned with kind of current management strategies that we have, like close-up grouping and, and feeding of cows and even, even post-fresh as well, the same kind of thing. And as Dr. LeBlanc pointed out, probably more important for us to realize that the success of cows in early lactation is not necessarily limited to that time frame, and, and we need to go back, like he mentioned, to the end of the previous lactation and probably even earlier, right, because we think of uh, there's more and more thought that, that that transition at dry off is probably the first kind of and, and, and most or not most important, but it is an important transition as well. And, and how the cow, uh, the shape that she's in at that point, et cetera, and, and as she moves into that dry period is uh, has a significant impact then on, on her success through that time period as well. And, and so those are so so we have to think of transition as uh, a calving transition is a bit more of a holistic type thing. Well, that was a perfect transition into my next question, part of the pun. Um, so we have a question from Sammy, one of our attendees, and she was wondering your thoughts on having one dry group instead of two. So I guess kind of lengthening out that transition or the defined transition period. So in that case, would you suggest a DCAD diet through the whole dry period? And what would the impacts on body condition scoring be? I'll, I'll have a go if you like. So I would say in a, in a perfect world, um, I would probably still have two dry cow groups. So basically a far off and a close up uh, as, as we think of it now. Um, and that would allow us to tailor things in that nutritionally in that close up group, specifically, for example, to include um, an acidogenic supplement, for example, or, or in other words, a negative DCAD diet there. Um, it, it is possible to feed a negative DCAD diet throughout the dry period. There, there's a few studies that would say that that's not a problem, although it can be expensive. Um, there is also, though, some data to suggest that that prolonged period of acidification, so six or even eight weeks, um, it, it's certainly not necessary and, and it might not be beneficial, um, especially if, if uh, first lactation or heifers are included in there, which in a perfect world, they, they wouldn't be on that acidogenic diet anyway. Um, that being said, I really think it's a herd by herd decision because depending on your facilities and depending on your herd size, at least some of the time it's, it's possible to do a better job nutritionally and in terms of group changes and so on with a single dry cow group 
And so at least for some herds, I, I do think that's a viable strategy as we get into, you know, building new facilities and having the ability to kind of start from scratch. Um, to me, today's best answer would, would be two dry cow groups, but uh, that there's some flexibility there. Uh, if I can add uh, some comments there, um, I agree with uh, Stephen uh, that two uh, groups would be better. And uh, there's some recent uh, data from uh, Achilles, uh, Vieira Neto, and uh, Jose that it kind of shows that the exposure to a prepartum diet, it kind of has a, a quadratic effect in terms of a length of that exposure. So uh, too much um, might not be good. And if you don't expose the cow uh, uh, to that diet, you also have uh, complications. Um, so then t it's important for you uh, to consider that when you're deciding uh, the 102 diets, but also keep track on gestation length in your herd and uh, how you're making decisions of moving cows and when you're drying off or moving to a close-up pen, that those are important things. And related to your question of a body condition score, what would happen? Uh, it depends on what you're feeding, basically. So you can have everything happening during the dry period and based on some research that uh, was recently published as well by uh, Dr. Ricardo Chebel, the best thing uh, you can have is to maintain the body condition score during the, the dry period. So you basically you cannot make corrections there uh, related to a body condition score. And that brings also the importance of drying off cows with a moderate body score. So if you dry off cows with a body condition score of 3, 3.5, it's easier for you to feed a decent diet and maintain the body condition score for that 40 to 60 days that they will be uh, dry. And that will be the best scenario for the health postpartum, I would say. And we can link that to your previous question as well, Heavy, in terms of a definition. I think that three weeks prior, three weeks after is fine when we think about uh, physiological changes that are happening or metabolic changes that are happening, feeding behavior. Most of the changes are occurring there, but a lot of what is happening around that period uh, have an impact on that, on those changes uh, in that window. So, so that's why it's important for you to look at more on a holistic level of management. Uh, when we think about producers that do a good job and their farms uh, in terms of transition management is, at least in my experience, is difficult for you to find another place in management that you can say you're not doing a good job. Normally they are doing a good job on almost everything. And that has to be the mentality. It has to be a constant um, because I think the body condition score is a good example if you dry off a cow with a body condition score of four, you already have a problem, right? And uh, that should have been fixed much earlier than that. So, yeah, so that, that will, those will be my, my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. DeFries, you might like to start this next question off. Um, what, are the current, what are your current thoughts on the Goldilocks diet and what feedstuffs would you recommend incorporating? Yeah, and that actually ties in with kind of the responses from the, the last question there too. And, and thinking of what Dr. Ribeiro just said too about promoting consistency in body condition. So drying those cows off at a good body condition and then keeping that consistency through the dry period. Some of the idea even between behind a one group dry, dry uh, group and one group feeding program for dry cows is, fits into that as well where we can likely maybe even slightly say shorten the dry period in some circumstances and feed a consistent diet throughout to basically match the uh, nutrient requirements, specifically the energy requirements of those cows over that time period and maintain that body condition that we want on those cows. And that's really 
kind of the premise behind that Goldilocks diet idea is, is based on the premise of the Goldilocks story, which is not too much, not too little, but just right. Um, uh, in this case, uh, energy instead of the, the heat of the, uh, the porridge being fed. But um, yeah, so, so it's really trying to target the amount of energy for those cows in terms of meeting their requirements for maintenance as well as any uh, growth that may be for younger animals as well as fetal growth uh, that, that's happening in that, in that cow. Uh, and so typically looking at a target of for mature Holsteins, 17 to 18 megacals per day, again, depending a little bit on cow size. Uh, but at the same time, uh, with the premise of trying to maximize bulk intake and, and uh, because there's been demonstrated benefits of basically maximizing not energy intake per se, but total gross intake in terms of bulk feed density, which in our work as well as others has demonstrated to have a positive impact in terms of not only the feed consumption levels of those cows into the next lactation, but also in terms of rumen health, in terms of absorptive capacity uh, of, of the rumen as well. And so that's really where we've seen success there. And so controlled trials is, and, and field trials indicate that that is success, can be successful. Um, and, and in terms of feedstuffs, normally we do this by, yeah, kind of bulking up that diet with low nutritive feedstuffs. Uh, most popularized has been adding straw and in this part of the world, wheat straw. But there is also opportunity for incorporating other things, say poor quality, lower energy, high fiber, grass hay. Uh, again, we have to be careful from a uh, mineral standpoint there, making sure that it's, it's low potassium, if, if that's the case. Um, uh, but we also consider other byproducts and we've had good success. Again, depending on availability, things like uh, oat hulls uh, have been incorporated in, in fairly substantial amounts as well when, when available uh, as an opportunity to cut that energy density down while still allowing those cows to uh, consume a, 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 a bulky ration. Probably the biggest thing in, in this, and that's where some of our both, uh, again, controlled work and field studies have demonstrated is, is we need consistency in consumption. So doing things, as I talked about in my presentation, to eliminate sorting and, and as well as, and, and therefore making sure the cows eat the diet as consumed. And, and that comes back to management as well. So all cows eat the same as well. And so uh, social environment, stocking density, all those things important there as well. Perfect, thank you. And what level of confidence would you see in nutritional solutions aimed at boosting immune response to improve transition issues? Uh, so there's no magic feed ingredient that is, you know, going to be, be the wonder potion for immune boosting. I mean, we, we know that cows maintaining their immune function, innate immune function is, is really important. It, it's a challenge. Um, on the one hand, nutrition is, is really important. So, um, and, and almost everything about it. I mean, mounting an immune response um, requires a lot of energy, protein, minerals, and so on. So if, if nutrition in terms of supply of, I mean, really every nutrient almost that you can think of, but in particular, um, some of the antioxidants like vitamin E, selenium, but, but you could also add um, zinc, you could add sulfur containing amino acids like cysteine and methionine, um, copper, you know, the list goes on. So if on the one hand, if you don't have those things right in terms of formulation, which isn't usually a problem or consistent delivery and, and feed access and so on, then that, that will definitely be a problem. On the flip side though, um, there's probably a plateau in, in response to any given nutrient that you could think of. So it's not like if we, you know, if, if X is good, then two X is really good and four X is really gonna make a difference. Um, so it, it's, it's super important that, that um, nutrient supply be adequate. Um, but but then that response is going to start to plateau, and, and we need to think about other other things that we tend to lump in under under management, like feed access and group changes, and avoiding other stressors and so on. Right, and I'm actually going to shift gears a bit here towards Dr. DeFries's work with personality and behavior. 
Um, how malle malleable is personality type in cattle? And is personality more likely a result of genetics or the environment? Yeah, good question. I guess in, in classic definition, the personality of the animal would be a fixed thing. So not necessarily malleable. When we, when we think about behavioral traits, um, we talk about plasticity of behavior, which is really that malleable kind of nature of it, right? So um, there are definitely kind of individual behavioral traits that may be, yeah, more plastic, so to speak. And, and so uh, under different circumstances, and just was being mentioned, like social effects, for example, feeding competition, we know that a cow's feeding behavior might be fairly consistent, but you put her under a, a certain kind of stress situation, like a social stress situation of over overstocking, suddenly we see a change in her behavioral repertoire. And so that would kind of speak to that plasticity or, or malleableness of, of her behavior. So those, those things do definitely exist, but um, there is good evidence. And, and that's what I briefly mentioned in my presentation it, of the fact that some of these things are less malleable and more classically defined as kind of traits within the animal. And, and we're still kind of scratching the surface. We do know there are genetic components to that. So some of these things are heritable. And I think that's where more and more research is being focused, looking at how much of that is heritable. And I think that's where we have some real opportunities as well. We can define some of these where we're, we're using a lot of phenotypical data right now to uh, tr yeah, improve our, gen uh, like our, uh, our, our genotypes of our cows. And, and this might be one area where we can do that actually and identify some, some, some genotypes that are potentially heritable and, and, and use that from, from a selection standpoint. At the same time, we know that uh, nurture uh, also has a huge impact. And so right from early life, just like, uh, again, from a genetic standpoint, there's, there's imprinting uh, on those animals based on management and feeding. We also know that the way those things happen as well are gonna influence behavioral uh, development. And so looking at opportunities to affect the behavioral traits of those cows early on life as well is, is something that we're interested in. And, and definitely there are opportunities there. It's pretty interesting. Um, and what would you say are practical behavioral or design interventions that could help improve the use of robots in more fearful cows? Uh, I guess probably a combination of different things. So, so uh, I would say, yeah, again, starting with basics of even training animals, getting them accustomed to the system, that's probably a, a large component of that. Um, but then once the, those animals are there, also giving them the best chance of using the system uh, when they want to. Uh, and so again, recognizing that if there are certain animals that are uh, more fearful, it, it, they're probably not only fearful to the system itself, but maybe even to other things going on and around their environment, including their con specifics in, in the herd. And so then uh, design features of the barn, including uh, space in and around the robot, being having good sight lines to that robot being important. Uh, and then stocking density, right? So competition affects, uh, so the density of animals in that pen are also gonna be, uh, have, have a role there too. And that's, for that reason, we see those, the, we see those impacts. So when we look at a field level, we look at things like stocking density in pens, it affects their behavioral patterns within those robot pens, it affects their milking visit frequency, et cetera. So, and, and my prediction would be that if we were to really parse those animals out, we would see differences between kind of more fearful animals versus more bold animals. If, if we were to look at that in relation to things like density in the pen as well. Right. And Dr. LeBlanc, we had quite a few questions relating to your uh, decreased milking frequency research. Um, the first being, how long would you do the once per day milkings? And were mastitis and somatic cell count monitored during this period? Yep, so uh, to, to give credit where it's due, that was uh, Maggie Williamson's um, master's thesis research. Um, and her main advisor was Todd Duffield there. Um, I was just sort of involved off in the corner of that work, but 
but, but it is a, a really uh, kind of innovative and, and interesting approach. So briefly, they screened cows for ketosis, enrolled all the ketotic cows on uh, drenching with glycol, and then randomized them on the robot to be milked either once or twice a day. And in the study, that was done for 14 days. And so that really did um, substantially improve the ketosis cure rates, especially for animals in the first lactation. Um, but it knocked their um, almost full lactation production down by about 15%. So and now I want to be clear, I'm kind of speculating beyond the data here, but based on the ketosis improvement responses, I, I would speculate that perhaps three days of once a day milking would be would be the next thing to study. And, and I guess I'm picking my words there. I mean, you know, people could certainly have a dabble with that in the field, but um, my, my wearing my professor hat, I guess I, I'll put in a plug to say we, we, we need to do that trial and, and see as opposed to kind of running off willy nilly. But, but that would be my best guess is, is somewhere around that um, three days of, of once a day milking would, would be, a, I think, a sensible place to, to look for the next study. Um, they, they did look at, uh, there was no difference in the incidence of clinical mastitis on those cows that were once a day milked um, and, and statistically no difference in their cell counts uh, either. So that, that didn't appear to be a problem. Great, so continuing on with ketosis, is there a more practical or accurate way to measure BHB levels besides on-farm testing? So if you mean other than testing individual animals with either, well, when we have lots of choices there, we can use milk, we can use blood, uh, we can also use urine, although it, you know, if you lock up 10 cows, you're probably lucky to get five urine samples at the time you want them. But um, th that certainly is the, the gold standard and, and doing that ideally twice a week. Uh, once a week is a really good start in the first two weeks, but, but twice a week would sort of sort of be the Cadillac program. Um, I'm guessing the question is alluding towards using the, the, the Lactinet or the, or the um, DHI testing program. And so th that's kind of a two-sided two coin. Um, the test in itself is, is very accurate. So I mean, if, it, if it says a cow does or doesn't have ketosis on test day, it's, it's, it's quite accurate. The issue is that with standard testing frequency of every five weeks, maybe, um, you're going to miss an awful lot of cases. So it, those, that approach can be useful for a herd to just look at their trends over time. Are we going up or going down? Do we have a little? Do we have a lot? Um, that's, that's arguably better than, than nothing. Um, but in a small herd, you know, if, you're, if you're milking even less than 100 cows or 50 cows, there's an awful lot of gaps in the data. And so um, it, it's not a substitute, I, I wouldn't say. So I, I, I think it, it, it can have a place. It can be a useful tool in the, in the drawer. Um, but un, until or unless we got to higher frequency of testing, it's not really a, a great substitute for doing some individual cow testing. Right. And one of our attendees, Alex, was wondering your thoughts on having a BHB level designed for an individual cow rather than having one threshold of 1.2 millimoles per liter. And he says that way our measures can be associated with the cow and her ability to produce milk efficiently instead of the herd. Yep. Um, so, so I think, again, I, I don't have that number, you know, if, if X then Y sort of thing, but, but I think as a as a next step in terms of research, that that does make a lot of sense. I mean, it, it was it was progress twenty years ago to to kind of work out um, some of the thresholds that we're still using, and I, and I do think they're still useful. But going forward, yeah, we'll, we would definitely seek to get more uh, refinement in in that into you know bringing more pieces of information to a, an algorithm or or a set of, of decision criteria to say this cow has a problem that benefits from some intervention, whether that's glycol drenching or once a day milking or, or some other thing, um, or that cow, you know, what she's actually just adapting to her considerable metabolic demands. She, she's okay, we can leave her alone. So the, the, the status we have right now, I, I sometimes liken it to smoking, you know, like a, a ketotic cow that, that's 
on average not a desirable thing. On average, it puts her at higher risk of undesirable things going forward, whether that's a DA or metritis or um, or worse pregnancy at first service, etc. But it, it's not a it's not her fate, and it's not a hard prediction. Not not every cow with ketosis gets a DA or 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 makes less milk than she otherwise would have. So. I guess that's a lot of words to say, yes, absolutely, directionally, that totally makes sense. But that's a work in progress and, and that won't be a small hill to climb, but but for sure that's the direction we'd like to go. And, and there's other groups um, that are already beginning to, to have a go at that. And why would you say so many cows fail to resolve ketosis after treatment? And what would be the best plan of action for these cattle? Should they be retreated? And if so, how many times? Yeah, so, so right now, if you have a ketotic cow, so, so let's say your blood BHB is above 1.2, which is our, our kind of standard, if imperfect, um, classification, and you drench that cow for three to five days with propylene glycol, which is kind of still the foundation of treatment, um, at the end of that course of therapy, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30% of those cows are probably going to still be ketotic. And um, again, sort of like we were alluding to in the last question, those cows are, are kind of uh, on a line or, or, or walking on an edge, so to speak, between an adaptive response to making lots of milk. So, so you know, cows need to make some ketones as part of their adaptation to, to making lots of milk and, and a little bit of milking off their back and, and so on. Um, but the question is whether that, and, and it's not just that one variable, but that's kind of the one that we can measure easily. So are they sort of on the good side of that line or are they falling off onto the, to the bad side of that line? And so uh, that was where the interest in the once a day milking came from. And so I would say today's best answer is the glycol is still the foundation um, from Jessica Gordon's work that I alluded to um, for cows that um, are kind of higher BHB out of the gate above 2.4 and or have low blood glucose at the time, which you can also test with the handheld meter. Um, those cows benefited from uh, an injection, daily injections for three days with a vitamin B12 based supplement. So that's one more piece of the puzzle. Uh, again, the, the once a day milking, I think potentially is, is another piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, so far, I'd say that's where we're at. Um, injection of dexamethasone is something we did in the past. We have another big study that says that doesn't look good, so I would take that one out of the toolkit. Um, and there's certainly other, other approaches that are in the development phase, but I, I'd say for today, those are, those are kind of the, the best, if imperfect, tools that, that we have. All right, I'll stop picking on you now. We have just as many questions regarding reproduction as we do transition diseases. So let's jump in, starting with a question for Dr. Ribeiro. An attendee was interested in the method you used to calculate the ROIs you presented, and were these values in Canadian or US dollars? Yeah, so the, the, the data I show is a preliminary analysis of, uh, that we have, and that was um, calculated based on the scenario of the death farm specifically, which was located in US, a large farm in US, uh, considering the milk price, uh, fee costs of the time that the data was collected. So the values are in US dollar. Um, the return of investment was just a simple calculation, just to provide some examples of how you can use that information. So uh, basically by the time you have a, a, a cost for a disease established, what you can do is play with scenarios where you're gonna reduce the incidence of a disease and see how much um, money that would generate by just reducing the incidence of a disease. So in, in the example that I use specifically, we uh, simulate a reduction from 30%, which was observed uh, in that form to 21%. So it's a, it's a major reduction in 30% incidence uh, in the incidence of disease. And then we apply this to uh, uh, untargeted interventions. That's how we're calling 
where you apply to the whole herd. So imagine that you're making a nutritional change in your diet that you're going to offer to all cows that are going to transition. Uh, so then based on the value that you found, the difference between 30 and 21% incidence of disease, you dilute to all your animals to the days that you want to make that intervention. So, and then you can assume, okay, I can invest all the money and I don't mind just by reducing disease, I'm fine with that. So you can apply all that money. But if you want a one-to-one -one return, then you can apply half of that money that you calculate that kind of thing. So, so that's how we, we calculate those examples. It's just to exemplify, right? It doesn't mean that the, the value that I show will be the same for a different herd or it's just to give uh, ideas. Great, thanks. And with a reduced pregnancy rate when facing clinical disease, should a sync protocol be employed right away with all animals that have an incidence of disease in the first three weeks? Um, that's probably true. Um, so, of course, if a cow that had a disease, if, show, if a cow show asterisk, there's nothing wrong of inseminating that cow in asterisk, right? But the problem is um, those animals, they are less likely to show asterisk because of an ovulation and perhaps the behavior of them will be uh, the asterisk behavior might be affected. We don't know that yet, uh, but they are more difficult to be catching asterisks. And I, uh, Dr. Stephen uh, LeBlanc showed that in his presentation. Um, and the fertility is also lower when you breed them. So it will be more difficult for you to make that animal pregnant. So in that situation, uh, especially consider that I, they also produce less amounts of milk you have to work to get the animal pregnant as soon as possible in most cases. Uh, so that's why I recommend using a synchronization program just to make sure that this animal will be inseminated at a certain point uh, in lactation. But if the animal shows the asterisk and you want to breed after asterisk, there is no problem with that as well, uh, right? So um, just you shouldn't be waiting for a cow to eventually show asterisk. You need to be proactive. And normally what we have recognized so far is to work with group of cows. Uh, perhaps at some point we'll be able to go back to the making recommendations to groups of animals or even individual animals. But uh, so far what we recognize is working with group of cows, be proactive just to have consistency in your management. Um, and so the press sync, sync uh, program is what we preconize because, um, so uh, for example, here in Canada, it's common to see producers waiting and they're just using a cedar sink, right? Which is just off sync with cedar. And, and this is fine if you want to reduce interventions. Uh, but if you're looking for efficiency, a pre-synchronization program would improve the results of your synchronization program. So we did a study in the past that we compared the two approaches and we were able to improve from 35%, uh, I think, pregnancy per AI in a cedar sink to 45% with the press sink obviously. So pre-synchronization is always better than just putting a cedar during the program in terms of pregnancy per AI. If you want to reduce interventions, that's fine. It's your choice, but you're not looking for better efficiency. And when you look at pre-synchronization, you also have options. So if you want to increase number of readings uh, after estrogen detection, you can use pre-synchronization with prostaglandins because that allows animals to show asterisks and you can breed them on asterisks and only a few cows will reach the time synchronization program. Now you have a problem with a lot of anovular cows, um, low body condition score, then perhaps double off sync will be the best choice for you if you're thinking about efficiency. 
right? So, so this is true for cows with disease and without disease. So we don't make a lot of distinction. Uh, I think the comments I made in my presentation is that those cows will take longer to resume after cyclicity. They have lower fertility. So those are cows that you really need to work to get them pregnant. And I have a quick follow-up to the question that was just previously asked by Logan. Um, should the number of services be reduced before cows are moved to a do not breed list? Uh, so I personally don't like to use the number of breedings are, as a parameter to make decisions because um, for instance, if you have good asterisk detection and, and you're catching those cows returning to asterisk, you're giving them an opportunity to become pregnant, right? So I don't see a number of breedings being a problem. Uh, what is more important is uh, the time of lactation where in your herd, it doesn't make sense to make a cow pregnant because you still have 270, yeah, 77 days of gestation. And by that time, uh, you're gonna be drying off uh, cows with uh, very low amounts of milk or you have to dry off uh, before then the 60, 50 days. Uh, so it's more time of lactation than number of breedings. It's also important to emphasize that um, when we do economical analysis, the cost of breeding and even labor, breeding and labor is a very small portion of uh, the calculation, right? So um, number of breedings, I, I don't think is a good parameter for making decisions, but more time of lactation. That makes sense. And would you say the timing of a uterine infection has an impact on fertility? So for example, metritis during the first week of lactation versus closer to the first heat? Um, it might have an impact. I think Stephen might have a better answer than I do, but uh, it's not only about timing, but the severity of the disease and uh, metritis normally they are more severe than a, than a uterine infection of a cow that did not have metritis before and now out of sudden has a purulent vaginal discharge. Um, so that will be bad too for fertility. How comparable is with metritis even though it's occurring later, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't um, tried to isolate those two effects and maybe Stephen has done that. What I can comment is uh, about diseases occurring outside the uterus, where we try to, um, so basically we classify that disease if it was happening uh, in the first few days of a pregnancy development, before pregnancy development, but during the antral phase of follicle development, or in the pre phase of follicle development. Well, we thought that, or initial hypothesis would that during the time of pregnancy development would be the worst, then the antral follicle develop would be more susceptible than the pre follicle development. But when we look the effects were very similar uh, for any phase of uh, the disease when the disease was happening. So we didn't confirm our hypothesis. We saw a similar reduction in pregnancy for disease, doesn't matter when it was happening. For the uterine disease, I'll let Stephen, perhaps he has tried to isolate the effects of a different type of diseases, might have a better answer. Yeah, we have some data on that. And, and it's there's a little bit of a confounding effect in the sense that uh, a cow that's overtly sick with metritis um, pr presumably is not likely to be missed. I mean, if she's down in milk and has a stinky discharge, most likely she's going to be detected and almost certainly treated with systemic antibiotics. And, and in fact, the good news is that um, those treated cases of metritis, if, if that's sort of the end of it for their clinical uterine disease, the, the fertility, the pregnancy rate on those cows is actually quite good. Um, 
so, uh, whereas whether or not cows started out with a retained placenta or metritis, if they wind up with, say, purulent vaginal discharge and or metritis, excuse me, endometritis, endometritis based on cytology at a month or five weeks postpartum, that can actually have a bigger effect on their pregnancy for service and even their pregnancy rate going on for quite a few months. And, and the, the kind of the wild card is that right now, a lot of those cows in that latter group are not being detected and treated. And so you, in, for that reason, they wind up having a, a larger effect on the individual and, and potentially also on the herd's uh, overall pregnancy rate if, if there's enough of them. And I guess last but not least, that's why the at least the, the metra checking or the finding the cows with the purulent discharge at, at about a month, five weeks postpartum um, can be a real opportunity because it's, it's pretty easy to do. And we have a very effective on-label zero withdrawal um, treatment that will regain most or very nearly all of the the loss in infertility, at least in terms of pregnancy at first service. So again, for all those reasons, that's a that, that's an opportunity for a lot of herds if they're not doing anything about that right now. Right, and would any of you be able to discuss the impact of voluntary wait period on conception and pregnancy rates specifically in term of in terms of parity status? Uh, yes. Uh, so. Uh, First lactation cows, uh, I think what is important to keep in mind is that the, the peak, of course, on lactation is lower, but they have better persistence of lactation. And they are also less likely to be cool from the herd just because it's a younger cow, normally has better genetics, uh, producers, uh, it's more difficult to see than the cooling uh, first lactation cows. So uh, there is some evidence that if you delay uh, the voluntary waiting period for first lactation cows, that there might be some advantage. So uh, Julio Giordano's group has done a research on that where I think they tested moving the voluntary waiting period from 60 to um, 80, 85, 80, 90 days, uh, somewhere there. And uh, it was, as far as I remember, it was uh, good for primary pair cows, but not for multi pair cows. So uh, multi pairs don't have uh, uh, the same persistence in your production as primary pair cows, and um, they are more likely to be cool, uh, especially if the fertility is not good. So when you put out the cost of the replacement and, and everything, I don't think is is a good decision, but that also will vary from herd to herd, the overall milk production of the herd, the overall persistence, the cost of replacement heifers, all those things have to be uh, taken into consideration uh, when making those decisions. So I, I think uh, not, lately what we have seen people question is about especially herds with good fertility, that they have a consistent timing for establishing pregnancy after the end of the voluntary waiting period. And they are drying off cows with a very high milk production. Um, then it, it kind of makes sense for them to delay voluntary waiting period because they know if they delay that um, first breeding and they have a consistent reproductive program, they can extend the lactation cycle a little bit more and have cows dropping milk production a little bit more before the dry off, um, still being profitable, right? Um, so, so those will be the herds that are kind of making those decisions to extend the voluntary waiting period, I would say. I could just, I'll add just briefly. So I totally agree with what, what Eduardo said. And, and uh, that so far, uh, nothing has really changed the, the economic driver that optimally we have cows getting pregnant 
uh, to calve on a 12 to 13 month calving interval. So meaning they're going to get pregnant around 85 to 120 days in milk. So on the one hand, there's no particular bonus um, to getting a cow pregnant before 85 days in milk. But usually the problem we're dealing with is how many cows are getting pregnant uh, much later than the optimal timing. I don't think we're there yet on tailoring the voluntary wait period by health status, but but uh, that's kind of where we're going. I mean, so ideally, uh, you know, before I retire or something, um, we'll, we'll have a, a much smarter algorithm that would consider the cow's health history as a transition cow, that would consider whether it's genetically or based on her own data or both, you know, her probable peak, her probable persistency, the price of milk, the price of replacements, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and we could really, you know, start tailoring those decisions herd by herd, cow by cow. But we're not there yet. But, but, but what I would say is that the principle is still we'd like to get as many cows pregnant as possible between about 85 and 120 days in milk. That, that still seems to, to really hold up. And every herd should have some kind of a program, a, a backstop program, uh, to make sure that cows are not suffering from semen deficiency past 85 days in milk at the, at the latest. And, and we can certainly do that. Do you mind and, if I... Yeah, go ahead. Throw one more thing in there. Again, agree with both. And, and I think... It's important to realize too that, like Stephen was mentioning, there there could be opportunity for tailored programs for, say, individual cows. But as a whole, like our our focus uh, should be prevention always at the at the start, right? And so, minimizing and that's part of the discussion here, minimizing those challenges around transition so that those cows are ready to be bred. Um, before 85 days, right? And, 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 and so that we don't necessarily have to be pushing voluntary waiting periods later to accommodate problems that have occurred in those cows before. Now, like Eduardo was mentioning, there may be opportunity with, with more persistency in cows and things like that to lengthen out um, lactations. And so that might be a management decision then, right? To potentially push those voluntary waiting periods a little bit later, but never should it be based on the fact that, yeah, our cows have poor health and, and that's why we're, we're doing that, right? Well, that's the perfect transition. That pretty much sums up all the questions that we were asked during our webinar. I just have one more to ask before we clue up our discussion. And that is what's an example of a knowledge dissemination method that you use to share your research findings with your end user? Well, here's one. <laughs> um, you know, it, I think I think all of us have participated quite a lot in historically in in-person meetings, and and I, I, speaking for myself and probably for the others, uh, we're looking forward to when we can do that again. I mean, I think we've got a great tradition in the industry of um, sharing research from the university out to frontline producers in, in local and regional meetings and producers sharing their experiences and, and wisdom with, with each other. Um, you know, if, if there's been a, a, a little bit of a, it's not a silver lining, but a, a positive learning out of the, the whole pandemic and the restrictions that we're all living with, um, we've had to get a little more creative and, and, and use some other channels like, like this one. And there does seem to be an appetite from tune into webinars and podcasts and, and uh, pick up um, threads of information off of social media. And so I think that's something that we'll, we'll continue to use more even when we can and do go back to, um, to doing in-person meetings, hopefully before too long. Yeah, yeah, I guess I would add and again, agree with everything Dr. LeBlanc just said. Um, traditionally, I've felt kind of the most fruitful ways of disseminating air information are in, in well, in person and one-to-one -one kind of scenario, right? Where uh, we have live interaction with people. Um, 
particularly presenting to producer groups and getting feedback, that's generally where I actually develop the most, uh, most of my research questions from, right? And uh, because the end users tend to be, yeah, the, 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 the best scrutineers of our work from a research standpoint where we can present something and they'll just say, no, it doesn't work in the field that way or, right? And, and give you that honest feedback and then uh, challenge you to think about the question from another angle or, or think about different ways of, of, of getting at the, the problems that they're facing. And so that's really where, and, and again, we've adapted like like uh, Stephen said, through kind of electronic means to, to some of that degree. Um, I've, I've still relied heavily uh, on, on print media as well, uh, because again, there's still an appetite, strong appetite within the dairy industry for, for that kind of dissemination as well. Um, social media, again, not something that my, myself have necessarily grappled onto in terms of using for, from dissemination, but uh, again, I, I view that as an opportunity. Uh, there does seem to be growing, yeah, growing interest within the dairy community in that. Uh, uh, but it, I believe still at the end of the day, it, it's probably um, a multi kind of, yeah, multi factor approach or whatever you want to call it, right? In terms of trying to get the information out. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add, uh, but uh, just reinforcing what uh, Dr. DeVries and Dr. LeBlanc just mentioned that this in our interaction with the industry is very important. And not only with the producers, but with uh, the industry partners and uh, consulting people that are doing consulting services in the field. Um, so sometimes uh, there are things that we do that they look uh, very simple, right? Like, uh, for example, we talk about disease, it's common to hear, oh, I know disease is bad, right? But, it's been bad for years, right? And then we don't see major changes in, uh, in terms of uh, incidence or, or the consequences, how we treat, how we prevent. And there's lots of information, right? And uh, when I say uh, we don't see a lot of changes in terms of the average herd, what is happening, right? Uh, so the problem is still out there. So generating new data, trying to develop new tools that will facilitate people to understand the importance uh, I think uh, that's something that we have to do uh, in order to really drive changes and, and see uh, a real reduction in problems. So uh, even though everyone knows that transition is important, that disease is bad, we still have work to do. There are lots of opportunities. And uh, the more data that we generate, especially those that are simple for uh, producer or consulting people to look in a table or in a graph and show these are the consequences that we are having here. If we make those changes in management and reduce, this is kind of what we what we are gaining with this uh, and have that mentality of make things better, I think uh, is what we are trying to do, trying to accomplish uh, uh, in, in our uh, overall group here at their wealth, not, not only our lab, but uh, our group in general. Well, finally, would you guys like to give your main messages or the main the main key points that you would have regarding the transition period before we clue up? Maybe in the same order as before. So Dr. Ribeiro, if you'd like to start. Yeah, uh, I don't want to be redundant, but uh, it's kind of the same messages before there's a lot of opportunities to improve uh, transition management and uh, uh, also opportunities for you to look at your management a uh, holistic view uh, because there are things that are outside the transition that will affect the transition period and there are opportunities to make a better prevent disease and uh, have a better profitability of in, in your production system. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of pick up on something uh, Eduardo said just a minute ago to, to, to wrap it up for me. And, and that's, um, you know, everybody, if, almost everybody would say, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. I've heard all this, you know, disease, bad, transition, important, you know, got it. 
Um, and yet, there, there's still a lot of opportunities there, not to say problems, um, for, for many herds. And so my take home message would be um, to, to bring in, for producers to bring in their advisors and for advisors to, to, to try to catalyze looking for some of those opportunities with, with your clients to say, okay, do we have a plan for making sure that every cow has a timely first service? Is the success of that first service um, where we would like it to be? And if not, let's just sort of keep going back through the process to identify the bottlenecks or the limiting factors or, or the positive opportunities. So whether that's the dry cow diet, whether that's social grouping, whether that's uh, figuring out how much ketosis we have in the herd and what we're doing about it, whether uh, same thing, figuring out how much uh, pearl and vaginal discharge or metritis we have in the herd and what we're doing about it. Um, again, it's 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 a lot of those things where the the principles are not new, um, but actually saying, okay, but we're gonna we're really gonna be proactive and take a hold of this and make sure that that we have a plan and, and actually take some action in our herd, um, th there's still lots of opportunity there for, um, for people. Because again, like uh, Trevor and Eduardo said, I, you know, we, we hopefully are providing useful information to producers, but at the same time, we learn a lot from producers. And you know, I'm always struck by the fact that when you go to herds with fantastic health, fantastic production, fantastic repro, and you know, ask them what their secret is, almost to a person they're like well i don't know i don't do anything special i don't do anything different than my neighbor and i mean that's sort of true but not true but really at the end of the day they're they're doing a lot of those little things right and and as new information comes out they they filter it for themselves and, and make those fine tuning adjustments so again that would be my take home is for, for whether you're a producer or an advisor to say okay you know i've heard all this stuff but, but let's let's look at it for our herd and, and say what you know what's something we could actually take action on here. Yeah, and I think Stephen just stole most of the ideas that were kind of floating in my head. Um, but I was kind of thinking the same thing. Like it's for certain certain farms are definitely our bottlenecks, and and those bottlenecks have to be kind of addressed. Specifically thinking around this time period. Uh, but when, yeah, you look at those farms that are really successful, um, it, it's, it's management of all those things, right? And, and so, yeah, putting those things together, when we, management's almost one of those intangibles, right? Uh, uh, and it relates back to individual kind of producer personality and approach sometimes even. Uh, but that's something that we do see consistently, right? Th those farms that are very successful have uh, just a different level of management and, and, and finding ways to um, promote that and encourage that. And, and like Stephen was just saying, even from a team approach, right? And, and getting as many uh, persons that are involved in terms of advisement and encouragement uh, in that process can, can be helpful from that standpoint too. And, and to, to realize that, yeah, like it, it does, it, it's, rarely just a one one fix kind of thing that's going to have have a huge impact or it's it's a multi kind of um multi-factor approach well with that i want to say a huge thank you to dr defries leblanc and ribero for such in-depth and constructive answers for all of our attendees questions i also want to applaud dr Steele and his graduate class for hosting such a successful webinar I'm sure a fresh start transition cow trifecta, as well as our discussion, will receive many views at the Dairy of Guelph YouTube channel. And thank you all so much for tuning in to our supplementary Q&A panel. We hope you enjoyed.